So we've got about 15 minutes to talk about enlightenment, and I figure we could pretty much cover the whole subject. So stay tuned, stick around for that, coming up on Talk Gnosis. Hi everybody, it's Father Tony here, and tonight we're going to talk about enlightenment uh, in various Eastern traditions as well as Gnosticism. And joining me is my co-host, Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Jonathan, how are you? Hello, Father Tony. I'm uh, very well. Uh, greetings to you and to Chelmsford. <laughs> uh, we have a, a very exciting guest tonight for, for what I think of as the uh, the end of Season 3. The end so, of Season uh, 3? Oh, sure. Well, I mean, just for season three, and then we'll have season four starting again in uh, late May. All right. So let's uh, introduce our guest. We got a little tease of his uh, lower third there, Deacon John DeGilio from the <laughs> Apostolic Joe and I Church. Welcome, Deacon. And the last time I think we'll get to call you Deacon on this show. Let's hope. <laughs> it's all good goes, to be back. If all goes well. Thank you so much for joining us again. So uh, we've talked with you about Buddhism before, uh, and I think that we're going to get a little bit more into some detail about um, the, uh, the specifics of enlightenment in, in both Buddhism and in Hinduism uh, and how that relates to what we call Gnosis. So uh, let's jump right in. Uh, let's start with Gnosticism because that's what our audience is here for. Uh, what do you think is the point of Gnosticism? Well, personally speaking, Gnosticism to me has always been uh, that tool by which we are trying to realize our forgotten divinity. It's, you know, we're trying to get back to that place from which we all emanated, whether you want to call it God, the Pleroma, um, you know, whatever term it is you want to give it, we're trying to seek that origin and to once again become part of it. And a big part of that is, of course, seeing through the reality of life as we know it. You know, cutting through that veil of illusion and attachment um, to understand that we do all have that divine origin. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the way that we experience that uh, is through Gnosis. Correct. Yeah. So... What's uh, then tell us about your understanding of Gnosis and, and Gnostic experience in a broader sense? Well, in a very broad sense, I've always looked at Gnostic experiences and um, insights as being, you know, those tools, those moments that help us lift the veil of illusion that I had mentioned earlier. You know, it's what helps us actually see the essential spiritual truth. You know, these are the moments of Gnosis. These are the Gnostic experiences. These are Gnostic insights. Um, very often in a more scholarly sense, we hear people talk about Gnosis as being knowledge. And that's basically what it is. It's this knowledge of the truth. Um, the thing is that we can argue all day as to what that truth is. So Gnosis is a very um, individualistic, very unique experience that depends on the person per se. So when people say to me, you know, what is the point of Gnosticism? Mm -hmm. uh, the point of Gnosticism is you. And, you know, again, getting you back to that point where you realize your own divine nature. And what are some of these... Um the experiences that get us to that point, Deacon, because in some ways I almost feel like when we describe Gnosticism, talk about Gnosis, can I just grab someone by the arm and be like, you're actually part of God, you have an inner flame, you have an inner fire, um, and it's, haven't they received the Gnosis? Well, you know, my uh, question to you on that is, is why not? Um, <laughs> yeah. We could probably sit here all day and talk about uh, what Gnostic experiences and insights are and never really agree. As I said, it's a very unique thing. Um, your insights, your experiences are very unique to you. Uh, you know, I've heard, I believe it may have actually been um, Monsignor Jordan Stratford at one point had written something about, you know, the sound of a, of a gull's wing as it, you know, passed over um, his shoulder, bringing a moment of gnosis. For others, it may be after spending time deep in some kind of study or meditation or prayer. Um, 
you know, later on when we talk about some of the pitfalls or dangers, I'll get more into this, but once you try to box in or define what these experiences are, I think you set yourself up for failure. Uh, the real challenge for Gnostics is to keep oneself open to having those moments, not dismissing even the most mundane things as not being helpful towards realizing, um, you know, one's divinity or having that moment of gnosis. It really is, as you just said, being able to look into any passerby or anything and realize that God is somehow there, is somehow part of that. So it runs the gamut of whatever human experience can be. The challenge to me, as I said, has never been so much finding those moments as, or pinpointing them, if you will, as it is understanding that you need to be open to them. You can't experience something if you've closed yourself off to it. Right. Yeah. So let's uh, let's try and <laughs> let's try and define it some more so that we can uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, t talk about enlightenment a little bit, and uh, specifically enlightenment in the Buddhist and the Hindu traditions, and. Um, are we talking about the same kind of thing as Gnosis, or are we talking about two different kinds of experiences altogether? <laughs> My first thought is to answer that by just saying yes. Because <laughs> you know, no matter what we say here, we're going to upset somebody. Mm -hmm. um, in the sense that, you know, in, again, more learned scholars who have studied this may say, oh, there's really no um, similarity between them. As somebody who has had more practical experience in various traditions, I really do see that similarity. I really do understand enlightenment as potentially being the same as Gnosis, depending on the angle you're coming from. When we talk about enlightenment in the Buddhist traditions, and my background is Soto Zen, so again, there are as many differences among the Buddhist traditions as there are among the various Gnostic groups. Mm -hmm. But generally, when we talk about enlightenment in the Buddhist sense, again, it's that coming to that state of realizing what life truly is, and that things are impermanent, and that this isn't all there is um, to who we are. That's enlightenment in the Buddhist sense. The same is kind of true in the Hindu sense, but they take it in a slightly different direction. In the Hindu sense, we talk about um, moksha, for example. You know, we talk about this coming to these moments of realization um, where we experience God one on one, we experience God within in us. So in many ways, yeah, it sounds different, but at the same time, we're striving for the same things. Even when you throw Gnosticism in there, we're looking for that essential truth. We're looking for that point of divinity that is within every one of us, that divine point of origin from which we've come. And it should surprise no one then that regardless of which tradition you're looking at, this can take a long time. Uh, some Gnostic groups I know talk about cycles of rebirth and death, uh, others do not. It's a more prevalent discussion among Eastern um, belief systems, this idea of reincarnation. Again, not all Buddhist and Hindu groups necessarily subscribe, but it's far more common. But it gives you this sense of, you know, it can take literally lifetimes of building to that point, of keeping yourself open to those moments, to those experiences. And, you know, again, from the practical sense, I can tell you how it feels very much the same to me. But again, I'm sure there's some scholar out there who's written something on this who is saying, boy, you know, this just isn't the case. Um, you will always have that. Again, I can speak very practically. And I feel like we're often talking about the same things we're just drawing on different cultural experiences and expressions to get us there. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, uh, that's a great way to describe it. And um, I, I think that what we'll talk a lot more about, I think, in the uh, podcast is, is um, how you have personally come to experience all of these different traditions. I, I think that'll be very interesting to our viewers. But um, uh, 
Can you talk a little bit in the in the few minutes we have left about the differences in Hinduism and Buddhism between this concept of enlightenment? Sure, I can again throw in some of what I've seen in the more practical sense and you know the heart of the difference I think is when it comes down to the idea of the soul itself. Um, you know Hinduism obviously has um, its deity or deities, depending on how you want to look at that. There is a belief in a soul or a super soul that imperme you know, permeates every one of us. Many of the Buddhist groups do not go in that direction. To them, there is, again, an ultimate reality. They do not dwell so much on the idea of, you know, what is the afterlife, who is the creator, um, as much as, again, this idea that life is impermanent, life is in many ways an illusion. Um, so there is a very big difference there. But again, to me, that big difference is more or less, again, how we experience it or how they've experienced it. So whereas Buddhists will not talk about God, uh, so to speak, or the creator, um, Hindus definitely do. So it's a difference in in perspective there. But again, if you dig down in beneath all of that, you find far more similarities than you do differences. And when we get to the podcast section, we'll talk about some of those practices. But there's your essential differences. In both cases, both groups see life as being, you know, a veil of illusion and attachment and, you know, full of obstacles that keep you from realizing the ultimate truth. It's just to some degree there's difference in what they believe that ultimate truth is. So whether one is rejoining um, with the divine creator or uh, simply entering into a state of never needing to be reborn again, uh, you know, that's how it breaks down. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you very much. And uh, that's all the time we have for the video portion. We're definitely going to get more into this in a lot more detail in the podcast. So stick around for that. Check out our website, GnosticWisdom.net, for information on how to subscribe to that. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to take a little break and start our recording again on the podcast. So thank you, John DiGilio, for joining us once again on the show. It's always a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me. All right, and for those of you who are watching along at home, we will see you next week. This has been a production of the Gnostic Wisdom Network. For more information about this and all of GWN's programming, please visit GnosticWisdom.net. The opinions expressed in this show do not necessarily reflect the opinions of GWN, the Apostolic Joannite Church, or any other organization. This has been released under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License and is brought to you by the generous support of our patrons. To support our programs and become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash g-n-o-s-t-i-c.